Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, session here of uh, Bata- uh, Bates Botanical Boot Camp. Um, today, we're going to be talking about propagation. Now, there's a number of different ways to propagate plants. Uh, we're going to be speaking mainly about four different ways. Um, and let's start by talking about what propagation is, really. Propagation is just the making of new plants from another plant. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be seeds, which is a natural form of propagation that happens all around us in nature all the time. Um, and then the other three is going to be cuttings, uh, layering, and grafting. All of these things are done by humans. It does not happen naturally. It can happen naturally, but for the most part, it's done by humans. So, um, propagation is one of my favorite things about horticulture. I think it's fascinating. It's kind of what got me into horticulture in in the first place. So it's a really fun topic for me, and I hope we uh, learn a lot today. So first things first, uh, let's talk about seeds. Now, seeds are amazing, to say the least. Um, If you look out in the woods and you see all these huge tall trees, oaks, maples, whatever it may be, all of those plants started from the tiniest of seed and worked their way up into a giant tree. So to me, that's fascinating. uh, Very cool. Um, Now, what we can do, though, is we can collect those seeds or get seed packets from the store and start them ourselves. Um, So I'm going to teach you how to do that. What I've got here is a seed starting tray. We call them flats. Uh, It's good to have these. They're made most of the time of plastic. You can also get them in little peat um, pots that you can plant directly into the ground after they germinated. Um, But I like to use the plastic ones because I can use them year after year as long as you just keep them clean. So first two that we've got today that I brought in here are zinnias and hyacinth bean. Hyacinth bean is one of my favorite vines to grow because you can literally plant a seed and at the end of the season it may reach 20 feet tall and be a blooming specimen. Uh, It's a really cool plant, uh, very easy to grow from seed. So um, do know that zinnias are a very easy one to just sow directly outside. You don't necessarily have to start them indoors. Once the weather warms up, uh, you can more or less scatter these across the ground and they're going to pop up anyway. A question uh, that a lot of people have is why do we want to grow things from seed whenever you can buy all this stuff here when they're already up and pretty and blooming? Well, the simple answer to that is is that you can get way more bang for your buck. You can come out here to our store and you can buy one single zinnia plant in a four-inch pot for $1.99, $2, and that's one. Or you could buy this seed packet here that's $1.89 and get about, looks like, gosh, close to 50, 60 seeds in here. So you could potentially have 50, 60 plants um, for, you know, get a lot more of it for a lot less money. So that's the reason a lot of times why we grow seed. Most, um, you know, nurserymen and growers that grow all these annuals that we, we get shipped in already up, they've started all these things from seed. That's, that's how it's the most e- economical way to do it. So um, these are very easy seeds to start, and I'm going to show you. So, you know, when you start and say a vegetable garden, you can get a jump on the season by planting seeds as well. You can do it inside your home. Um, if you have great sunlight around a window, you don't necessarily need any grow lights or anything. You can use your window. You just got to make sure you rotate these things, um, you know, so they get the most sunlight. But you can get a jump on the vegetable garden if you plant this stuff about six weeks before our, na- our last frost date and get them already up and ready to go. And you don't have to worry about buying them, you know, later on. So. Now let me show you just how to do this. Um, it's not all that difficult to do, but there's a couple things that you need to know. Um, starting off with some seed starting mix. It's just a very light potting mix, so it's got a lot of uh, you know drainage to it, but it also has a lot of re- water retention as well. Which you want to have moisture around your seed coat um, almost all the time if you can help it. We don't need it staying just soaked all the way through, but keeping it evenly moist on top where the seed is is going to be helpful. Another thing that's helpful before you even start planting your seeds is to go ahead and if they have a hard seed shell like beans do, this has a bean, let me open them up. I got this bean too because it's a really cool looking bean. They call them Oreo looking seeds because you can see they've got black on them with a little white deal right there in the middle so they kind of look like Oreos. A cool little seed. But it does have a pretty hard seed coat. So a method that we call um, in, in horticulture is called stratification. And that is all that means is you're going to drop this in water for overnight, you know, 12, 24 hours, however long. That softens the seed coat enough to help it break through dormancy. So if you want to soak these overnight, that'll be helpful. Another way to, um, to scar a seed is the call, it's called scarification. And that's just by, you know, more or less taking some sandpaper, roughing it up a little bit, making a little nick in it. Whatever it is to kind of soften that seed coat a little bit is going to help out with, with germination. So... 
<clears throat> next thing we need is to add our soil. And I'm just going to do a little bit. I'm not going to fill this whole tray. I'm just going to show you. I don't want to get too dirty in here. I'm going to put that on top. Kind of work it into the cells. We're going to press down pretty firmly on this. We don't want it real, real light because when you water it, it's going to just settle too much. So we want to press that in, make sure it's even on top. And they're pressed pretty good where we can see the cells. And next, we're simply going to add our seed. We're going to sit it right on top at first. I'm going to do the hyacinth bean first. These are a bigger, much bigger seed than zinnias. Uh, general rule of thumb as seeds go, I think one of people's biggest problems is that they bury a lot of these things too deep. Um, we don't want to do that. So what the general rule is that the bigger the seed, the more you can bury it. Um, this hyacinth bean is fairly large, so I'm going to give it a good press. I'll show you what I mean by that. I'm just going to set a few on top. You don't have to worry too much if you have more than one in the same cell. You can separate those later. I'll show you in a little while how to do that. Um, beans are very dependable germinators, so if you want to just go a single one per cell, um, that'd be fine. And get these where they need to be, try to get them close enough to the center there. Just pop them in, center of all these cells. Okay, so now um, this is the part that I think a lot of people mess up. Don't go too deep with it. All we're going to do is just press them. So we're going to press that down just a little bit, about not even a half a finger worth. You see, I'm just pressing them into the soil. Just press them all in first so they're seated in there nicely. Doesn't matter what orientation, they will find their way up. A little more dirt in this one. And then we're just going to cover them back up and press firmly. So we have a nice, you know, so it's not moving, not going anywhere whenever you move it around your house or if you have to, you know, move it to where it's going. So they're seated in there nicely. So simple as that with the hyacinth bean. That's a pretty far press on how deep I, I went right there. Zinnias, different story. They're a little bit smaller seed. Also too, these seed packets are very helpful on the backside. It gives you all sorts of, of directions, like how many, you know, how long it takes to germinate, uh, when to do it, how much sun they're gonna need, how to thin them, all that. So read your seed packets, because it really is helpful. So then once again, I'm gonna put some zinnia seeds. These are very hard, they're, they're kind of annoying to work with, so it's hard to get one in each. So if I get two, I'm fine with that. There's even three in that one. I got four in that one. Dumped a lot out. All right, let me move some of those around. Try to get one or two per, not having four or five. That gets annoying to try to separate them later on. Move those around the whole seed tray. So there you go. So these are zinnias are very flat seeds. They're kind of long, but they're very flat. Um, they're kind of soft. They don't necessarily need a soaking unless you just want to do it. it. Like I said, it never really hurts to soak them overnight before you plant them. It just softens that seed coat a little. So once again, we're going to press. With these, we're not going to go quite as far. Just going to press them close to the soil surface. All worked in. And then cover back up and press. Time consuming, but it's kind of fun. All right, so we've got all those worked in, soil pressed down firmly. So now we're ready to go. Um, the next step, which is crucial, which I'm not going to show you in here because we have too many wires and such, but you have to water. We've got to make sure that this is evenly moist through the whole tray. So a good way to do it, and I believe these even come with it, this little... little uh, plastic tray underneath can be used as a dome or a cover if you want to get more moisture and more of a greenhouse effect or you can use it as a watering pail so if you wanted to water the inside of of this plastic that's holding water you can put fill that up with water let these sit in here these have drainage holes in them so this dirt is going to act like a wick and it is going to take up any excess moisture that's in there you can watch these things and after a few hours of watching it soak up you'll see the tops of the of the soil get moist once you see that you can remove the water and you know that it's evenly moist throughout the whole um, seed cell um, another way to do it is to simply just water overhead just be gentle with that the dirt is really it can get washed away pretty quickly um, so we want to try to avoid that <clears throat> um, so Bo, you know, we sell little nozzles here that you can put on the end of a uh, what what's this for <laughs> 
Oh, I'm not going to water with this. <laughs> we, w what I prefer to use is I'll take it outside and I'll use a wand, a watering wand, and I'll put a nozzle on the tip of it that has a very fine stream. That's going to be my seed watering um, nozzle. It comes out at a very small little droplets that come out, very fine mist, if you will. Um, and I just kind of spray it up top, let it kind of fall flat on it. Uh, that's going to help out. But we want to make sure we keep the soil, like where that seed is, we need to keep that moist because what's going to make a seed break dormancy is uh, moisture um, and warmth, really. Sunlight doesn't matter all that much. Some things benefit from sunlight. I know lettuce. Uh, lettuce is such a small seed. You can lay that on top of the dirt. You don't even have to bury it, um, and it benefits from a little sunlight. But a lot of seeds, it doesn't really matter. What it's mainly all about is moisture and warmth when the springtime arrives. So um, we've got our seeds planted. They're going to be coming up here pretty soon. And once they're up, that's whenever we need the light to be a factor. So like I said, if you have a really great window, um, usually that's sufficient enough for seeds. One big problem people have um, is they don't have enough sunlight for seedlings. Um, and it's a big problem with, say, like tomatoes or peppers. You get those planted in your house and you put them in the window and then you start to see them stretch. What I mean by that is that they get tall. Uh, they get pretty tall, but their stem stays really weak, and they'll end up flopping over. They just don't have good, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of muscle to them yet, if you will. So uh, the use of grow lights is really nice. Now, I don't use grow lights very much myself personally because I've, for the over the past decade, I've worked at, at greenhouses. So I've got, you know, plenty of warmth here. I've got sunlight over greenhouses. I don't need to use grow lights. But my brother-in-law at his house, he starts his tomatoes every year inside his home. He's got a pair of, he's got a set of grow lights, not all that fancy, not all that big. Um, but he uses that and he's had much better success with his tomatoes in the, um, in the early, early spring when it's too cold to set them out to get them nice and chunky which is what we want. We want those stems to be firm whenever we want to set them out into the garden. <clears throat> all right. So yeah, we've planted some seeds. It's not hard at all. Um, it's really pretty simple, actually. Um, now, with all of these seeds as well, we don't have to use these trays if we don't want to, like I was talking about earlier. Whenever, this, whenever the weather warms up, we have no more you know, danger of frost. Then you can set your seeds out. They'll come up in the garden just fine. And um, it's a lot more, like I said, cost effective, especially with something like zinnias. Everybody knows zinnias. Uh, one of the easiest seeds to just throw about, and you're going to see zinnias come up every year. You're going to see them reseed every year. They're going to drop their seeds from their mother plant, and they're going to naturally lay dormant in, over the wintertime in the ground and come up whenever the weather is, is nice enough for them to come up. So, yeah, seeds are pretty impressive. Oh, yeah, I wanted to mention about seeds. The biggest difference with what we're going to talk about here in a minute is with um, what humans do. To plants to modify them to get new plants is different than a seed. The only way you get genetic variation with a plant is from seeds. Uh, that's where, you know, pollen from male parts of the plant or flower come in contact with the female parts. That's what creates the seeds. The next season, say you cross a zinnia, say two zinnias, you got an orange one here, you got a yellow one here. Say a bee comes along and creates, you know, pollen that transfers between the two of them. What you're going to see the next what you potentially will see on the next crop is, say, a yellowish-orange um, bloom. That's how we get, that's how hybrids occur. That's a natural hybrid that occur uh, in nature. We can make hybrids occur by doing it for them. So, say, like, if you wanted to try this at home, a plant that's really easy to do it with would be daylilies. Daylilies have flowers that are really, they have very prominent reproductive structures. You can very well see a sticky end, which is the female receptive end, and you can see below that the anthers that hold the pollen from the male part. So what you can do is go to a different daylily, get some pollen off of one of the male parts, come dust it on to the female part of the other one, and you can naturally hybridize a plant after you collect those seeds and see what you get next season. It's a lot of fun to do that. Um, not all that hard. Like I said, daylilies are an easy one to start with. So yeah, genetic variation. That's how all new plants occur, and um, it's just a fun thing to do. We've got a quick question here. Sure, um, go ahead. What about native plants that need a cold stratification? Yes, and they're, what you want to think about is mimicking nature as much as you can. So native plants that are in the woods, what do they do? They, they flower, they set their seed, and then once their seed dries enough, it will drop off. And once it drops to the ground, it will get more or less cold stratified through the wintertime just based on moisture levels through the winter um, that soften the seed coat and then that cold temperature that keeps them dormant. Um, so yeah, what we can try, so how we do that is all we're, we're going to do is harvest the seeds and we're going to put them in our refrigerator and just a little brown paper baggie or whatever. You can put them in the fridge. You don't have to keep them wet at that point. They can just be 
they can just be cold during the, the dormancy season. So just put them in a paper bag, put them in the fridge, and wait till you're ready to plant them. Um, however you want to do it, either inside or outside. It's a good question, though, but nature does that for us. We got another question, too. Go um, ahead. When, when do you transfer from starter tray to large container and then to the ground? More or less, you're just going to check it. So whenever you see your plants have germinated and they've come up and you see a stem that's elongated enough for you to kind of play with it, um, you're going to take that stem and just kind of tug on it a little bit. You're not going to mess it up if you pull some of that out and say it, you jerk the whole thing out, <clears throat> then you're still going to have some roots on that. You can simply put it back in there, press the soil around it, and water it, and you'll see those roots expand into their seed tray. Whenever you are going to take things out, though, what you want to do is there's going to be a plant right here. You're going to grab it by the stem, and you're going to squeeze this bottom part of this cell right here. Squeeze it loose, and you'll see how much root you've got. So as long as you've got some crisp white roots in there, which you're probably going to on a new seed like this, uh, you can put it into a bigger pot. Um, this is mainly with annuals and, say, vegetables and things like that. There's going to be some other things we'll talk about later that you want to leave in their trays or their pots for a little bit longer than that just so they, they finish a little more. But these seed trays are very small, so most of the time when the plants start to grow and you see them actively growing, they're going to actively grow down below too and give you a good amount of root mass that you should be able to get those out. But more or less just trial and error, tug on it a little bit and see how loose it is if it's ready to come out. <coughs> Any more questions on seed? Oh, I was going to show you this. Well, I got it. This is kind of cool to me. This is a, these are coffee trees, and these have been started by seed. A lot of growers, like I said, will do this. I wanted to show you this because this person dropped one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different seeds inside this tiny little pot. Long time ago because coffee takes a while to germinate. And they pretty much all came up, it looks like. So you can do this yourself. If you just want to use a larger container, say something like a container this size. I'm going to use this later. But if you wanted to use a container this size and just scatter a whole bunch of seeds over the top of it, press them in like I did with this and then walk, keep it moist. You can do that. And then later on, as the roots get big enough, you can just simply take it out of its pot like you can do with this. And you can take these stems and just separate them. So you break the dirt apart, see where we're at. Got little seedlings like this. Perfect little seedling, got roots. You can even put them in a seed tray if you wanted to. So I got my little Sharpie here, helps out with this. Make a little hole. Pop it in there. Press it firm is, is really pretty key. You want to do that. Make sure it's firm. And then you can literally make eight new plants out of this little coffee plant. So with your seeds, it's no different. You can do the same thing. As long as you've got a little bit of root mass down there, that's really all you need for it to get started. The key is to stay, keep it moist right there around that root zone, but not sopping wet. That's what we always want to avoid. Sopping wet makes for nasty stuff, mainly pests and pathogens. want to avoid that. So keep them moist, not soaked. This is always fun to do. I, I actually have given gifts of this before. I just separate them and give them to people. Pretty cool. Got another question. Go ahead. Do you ever use soil blocks? And if so, what is your recipe? You know, you can buy those um, already kind of made for you. We use coconut core here is what we start with. It's similar to peat moss in what it does. All it is is just a product that expands after, you know, it comes in a block and it expands into, you know, something that you can use as a soil medium. Um, most products nowadays, if you, I mean, you can do that. There's no problem with it. It's more essentially the same thing that's what's in here. It's just this one's already broken down for you. So, um, but yeah, I, you know, they do make those little deals to where they, these little things that have, you even have a hole already in them. So once you, you moisten them and they expand, drop your seed in there and cover it up and it, it stays pretty moist. But I don't use them all that much. I just like the trays. I just, it's just simpler to me. It's kind of how I was trained. So that's what I use. All right. Any more seed questions out there? What you got, Tyler? Anything? Uh, nothing right now. Nothing seed related. Yeah, they might pop up. I'll let you know. All right. All right, let's see. Well, we did pretty good on that, I think. I'm going to take this up in the garden center, see if any of these things germinate here soon. All right, so, yeah, done with seeds. Let's move on. My next topic is cuttings. Oh, we got one. Oh. <laughs> Can oh. A, seeding, a seedling or plant be transferred too many times? Uh, it's a... Good question. No, I don't. I don't believe so. As long as there's green matter on top and root mass down below, a plant can be moved. It's just uh, you know when to do it on some things, depending on what we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about outside shrub. We're talking about a seedling. Um, 
you know, what you want to avoid, I think, when it comes to transplanting and moving seedlings around is going from really small, like a little plug I was just showing you, something like this, into a really large container. There's really no point in that. I mean, unless you, if you're a good waterer, you can do it. But generally what happens when you do that is you put this tiny little plant in a big old pot and then it stays wet all the time because there's not enough root mass to actually take up that water and use it. So it just sits in kind of wetness. Um, avoid that. But other than that, no, I mean, you can, you can more or less transplant a plant indefinitely as long as you're, you know, as long as you know what you're doing. So yeah, no, don't worry about that too much. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, cuttings. What is a cutting? Well, cuttings are, simply put, it's, a, it's we, you cut plants to make them do what you want to do. So let me start with an easy one here. This is Plectranthus. Cool plant. Swedish ivy is a common name. Um, you can smell the leaf. It smells like lemons. It's really pretty cool. Really good. Um, and let me get my things here. So what you see, and another thing we can talk about with cuttings is, is that when you start to see plants get leggy, what I mean by that is they're starting to get out here. They're starting to trail. They're getting too much out here, not enough in here. It's a good time to take cuttings. Um, and this plant's starting to do that a little bit. But, you know, I'm just going to what I call cut the legs out of it a little bit. And I'm going to take a first cutting. So this is what it is. We're going to take a stem. We're going to take the desired length, however we want. Now, master propagators, people that are really good at this, can get a lot of, of cuttings out of this one stem. I'm gonna, this is a basic one. I'm just going to kind of show you all a basic way to take a cutting to get the best success. So we'll make our cut right in there is fine. And let's do a couple more. Why not cut the leg out of it a little bit more? You mind doing one on the other side, Austin? What's that? You mind doing one on the other side, uh, on this camera side here? This here? Yeah. Like taking a stem? Sure. Just showing them where where you're making the cut. And yeah, well, so you want to make your cut where you want the new growth. So I don't know if y'all can see that or not, but I've got a couple new growth. Let me get a better uh, angle in here. You might want to come out one, like towards me. Towards you? All right, so this is the long stem I want to cut. Where do I want to cut it at? I see some new growth. It's right down in here. Those two stems, I'm going to cut right above that, so those stay, and I'm going to use what I need to use. So we can just cut that up. What you do, too, is you just make this plant a little bit more tidy. I can go ahead and do a prune while I'm here just to show you how to clean up a plant, find the stems. I want to keep which ones I want to take. And we can make this plant a little bit tighter here in a couple weeks. All this new growth that we see down below is going to emerge and be... Uh, much bigger and it's going to poof and it's going to make a nice much tighter plant it's just good general practice to do that anyway so i've pruned this up and i've got cuttings i've got multiple cuttings here like i said i'm just going to use some of the biggest to show y'all how to do it so got my stem here by the way this is an herbaceous cutting this is not a woody stem at all this is just green um it's good to note that because there's differences amongst other woody plants. Uh, herbaceous cuttings typically seem to be some of the easiest ones to do, though, especially with, say, succulents um, or herbaceous ones like this. <clears throat> so what we need to do, where all these buds are and new growth and, and older leaves, we need to get that removed. What all cuttings have in common and what we need to know is that there has to be a wound for there to be new root growth. That happens with all these things I'm going to be talking about. It all kind of starts with wounds. So that kind of freaks the plant out a little bit. Whenever it causes a wound, it, it tends it to it makes it want to regrow or it makes it want to grow roots where that wound occurred. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to take off these side shoots here. Literally just with herbaceous ones, it's pretty easy to take them off. I don't need snips or anything. I can just take it off. I'm going to take all vegetative growth away. That means the green stuff. I need to get that out of there. Take it off that stem. All right, so what we're left with is what we call a node. These are nodes right here. That's where the bud forms and the vegetative growth we've removed. So what we've created is a wound. What we're hoping for is for roots to come out of those nodes. Now, to up your odds of better success, you need to at least remove two to three, three is preferable, um, of these. Uh, you need to expose at least three nodes. So let's take that off. Good, we don't have any vegetative growth on it all the new growth there so what i've exposed is now a stem with three nodes um, available to root from that's what we want so 
It's a good little cutting. It's very simple. Um, the easiest way after this, what we need to do is we need to incorporate water somehow. So one very easy way to propagate plants, which is the preferred method by me because it's very easy and I can see what's going on is simply using a, a bottle of water. Fill it all the way up to the top, drop that in there. I know y'all have done this before with a vase with all sorts of plants. You notice you leave them in there and they're looking pretty good and you wonder why and you look down and they've, they've shot roots because they're in enough water. Um, do note that you do not want to keep your your cuttings in water for too long after they have rooted um, it makes the roots more brittle um, and they don't transplant near as well so really whenever you first see a few different roots pop out from those nodes which you will pretty quickly within two to three weeks usually um, you can go ahead and get it out and get it into soil uh, moist soil and watch it grow from there so yeah very easy to just drop it into water um, but if you are going to put it in a finishing pot you are going to use a pot like this. Now, I didn't moisten this at all. Generally, I'm going to moisten my dirt before I ever put it in there. Uh, what you, a good consistency is to water it down and then mix it all together and feel it. Uh, see how it feels and then squeeze it in your hands. If you can squeeze it and it's, and it's like mucky, like wet, and it's dripping out, you've gone too far. Add it little at a time and it'll... You can get a consistency of moisture, but not soaked. So uh, that's a good way to do it. Start by, you know, make your dirt moist before you ever put it in this pot. Um, and my Sharpie. So, yeah, if you're going to use the dirt like this, all we're going to do is make a hole. I've pressed this dirt in pretty good, by the way. So you want to do that. It's going to help with keeping that moisture right around the stem, which is where we need it. Make that cutting, get that out of the hole and stick it. We're going to stick that right above the soil level. We're going to press firmly. Just like I've mentioned with a lot of things, you got to really make good contact there. Press firmly around. And we're not just going to use one. To up your chances, you want to just take more. So we're going to take all these little cuttings, and you can fill out this whole pot. Just break those off. Get them out of our way. This is a little bitty cutting. Doesn't matter. Little ones can root just like big ones can. Get that vegetative growth away. Question just came in. What's up? Do you use rooting compound? Oh, yeah. I brought that in here. I meant to mention that. Here. It's not as crucial. This is a rooting hormone here. It's uh, indole-3-butyric acid, um, if we're getting fancy. And, yeah, if you're going to use this, which you can. This really helps out. It's your friend. I didn't use it with this plectranthus because this thing roots so easy. I mean, it's going to root in water within a couple weeks, so I didn't really have to. It's a number of herbaceous things that are like that that you don't need to use this. We're going to get into something, though, that where you're going to need it. It helps out greatly. So let's open this up. Y'all can see literally just a white, dusty powder. You can use a little paintbrush if you want to dust it on like that. I usually just stick them. So I've got a good one here. Get that away. One more rung. So While I you're get doing that, somebody's saying peat is hydrophobic. Better to mix and moisten and then add to pot. What's peat, that? Uh, peat moss is hydrophobic. Better to mix and moisten and then add to pot. Yeah, I mean, that's what I like to do with really any soil medium I use whenever I'm repotting. It helps to just keep it all. That way you don't have to water it right afterwards whenever they're loose and wiggly. Um, so, yeah, moisten it before you ever put it in there. Get it to a good consistency and then add it to your pot. All right, so yeah, I got my cutting here. <clears throat> got three nodes exposed. Get some of this powder in here and just let you see. Literally just like that. It's just a white dust. It's going to help it root a lot quicker. If I were to take these back to the garden center and watch them grow, I bet this one would root probably quicker than those would. But like I said, they're very easy to root no matter what. All right, get my hole there. Press it. Get that in tight. And let's just do one more just to fill this pot and make it look pretty. It's another good thing about cuttings, too. You more or less make a pot that's already looks like it's finished. Tricking people and thinking that they have roots. They don't. But it looks like a pot that's already done. Got our hole. Stick it. Press it in firmly. After this, I'm going to have to water this. I would, If I were at my home, I would take it to the sink and I would put a slow drip to where it just... Um, you know, works its way all through the pot, filling it up multiple times so it drains fully. That method, or like I was saying earlier, put it in a tray of water and let the water be absorbed through the top. Once you see the different color on top where it's moist, you know it's worked all the way through. But that's a nice cutting pot. Already looks like a cute little pot um, that's already finished. So, like I said, within a couple, two or three weeks, you're going to have roots on these things. i got a question. Uh, <coughs> Go ahead. When using rooting hormone and propagating in water, do you add rooting hormone each time you change the water? 
in um no i don't think you would have to i mean you're going to dip your your plant stem in the rooting hormone first and then put it in the water um you know with a lot of plants they're going to root in the water even without this like i was saying with the herbaceous stuff like coleus things like that it, it, it's not really needed but no i mean every time you take them i mean you can dip it first if you want and then put it in the water that'd be fine um, but after that you should see roots after that and you shouldn't have to re-put it in water you just eventually take it to you know the, the potted plant and also uh this is just a sort of related question what do you do uh when fungus starts growing in the soil i'm using organic soil and herbs well fungus usually occurs almost all the time occurs because of a moisture problem and it's always on the wet end so if you're seeing like fungus gnats little you know bugs that hover above the top of the soil or you're seeing your fungal issues going on then it's probably going to be starting with a water issue something's going on um, if plants aren't actively growing enough which typically they're not over the winter time to take up the moisture they need to have less moisture in the pot with them so um, probably a watering issue we need to see where we're at on that if you're keeping it too wet that's how you're going to get those fungal issues if you do have it sometimes depending on the plant it's almost worth it to cut your losses and just get rid of it and restart uh, i say that because the risk of you spreading that pathogen to other plants and pots um, is a lot higher if you leave it there you can try to treat it with uh, with fungicides um, but a lot of times it's a losing battle um, like I said, if it's just herbs and they're cheap enough and they're viable enough, why don't you take some cuttings off of them? The plants that look good enough uh, have some healthy stems that are on them. Take cuttings of those, get them started, and you can just throw away that mother plant that's got the fungus on it, and you should have better better results after that. All right. And, uh, you know, you can keep typing your questions. We, n we might not be able to answer all of them in real time because we want Austin to get through with everything w within the hour, but we will have a Q&A at the end. Okay, so we talked about herbaceous cuttings, stems that plants that have green stems. Now we're going to move on to woody cuttings. What I've got here, what looks to y'all, is just three sticks. That's essentially what it is. These are Rose of Sharon. It's Hibiscus syriacus, a beautiful summer blooming plant that grows fast and has a lot of colors. Hummingbirds are absolutely in love with them. And I pick these sticks because they tend to root pretty easily. Now, what you see is these sticks have no leaves. They go dormant over the winter time. This is generally when we're going to take our cuttings of the old wood. You can do other cuttings during the growing season, but since we're in the winter propagation phase, I went ahead and got these. Now, what we need to know about plants that don't have leaves over the winter is that they're not actively photosynthesizing because they don't have the leaves. So um, there's not, they don't really need much attention, if you will, through the winter time, and you can leave them out. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But um, taking these cuttings is really no different than what I did with this. It just looks different because there are no leaves. So I can see all my buds though. Bud here, bud here, bud here, bud here. Uh, I'm going to cut to where I can get three of those down in the dirt and then two of them, even three sometimes to have better success, to go ahead and you know get three down below, three up high. So I've got bud here, bud here, bud here. I'm going to cut that right above the bud that I want to keep. And I've got my one cutting. You can take that same stick and create another cutting. This one I'm just going to leave the way it is because I've got buds down here that I want to stick. And I'm just going to leave that like that. This one here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Plus, I kind of want my sticks to be all the same size. So whenever they do you know, come up in the spring, they're going to be uniform in shape. So we'll make that cut right above that bud that we want. Set that to the side. We've got another one here. I'm going to take off this side chute real tight to the stem, creating a wound like I've talked about. This one's a little uneven, but nothing wrong with that. It's going to come up true in the spring. And one more, two, three buds. Then are going to go down. One, two, and get rid of that. I may just keep this one. I may take it like into there, see where I'm at size-wise. It's a little big. This ain't got to be perfect, but it's just, I just like uniformity. All right, so we got plenty of those. Another thing we need to do before we actually stick these in our pot is we need to remove the vegetative part of the bud. So this bud, if it were to be left on the plant that I took from the mother, this is going to want to be a vegetative bud. So it's going to want to shoot a leaf. We don't want that to happen. And plus, we want to create our wound. So we're going to nick those off. You can more or less just do this with your finger. You can you see some of that green in there. You're not damaging anything. You're actually helping the process. 
get rid of those vegetative buds. We've made a couple little nicks in it. And then this, what's nice about woody stems is that they're easy enough to stick without using anything. So we literally put them straight down in the pot. Get all those down in there as much as we can. Press firmly. Do that with all of these. Guess I don't have to do all of them, but nick those off, make a wound, stick them, press them. Already nicked some of those, nick some of those. Stick it. Press it. Oh, and by the way, the orientation we need you need to re remember the orientation. All orientation we have to stick these is is up. So, like I since this is the stick that was going up like that, if I were to stick this in like that, you're not going to get growth out of that. So we need to make sure uh, a lot of professionals, what they'll do is they'll use a Sharpie and they'll put a little arrow on which way's up. Because if you have a number of these, you're doing them all the time. It's hard to tell which way's up. So keep this stick going that with the orientation upright. Nick off that third bud there. Stick it. And one more. Stick it in. So we've got a nice little pot. Press it in firmly. Full of dormant sticks. So what we're going to do with these now, since it's winter time, is keep them outside. What we want to avoid, you're going to water this, okay? We're going to get this back moist. Uh, you don't really have to, but it just, it, it's better to, you don't want to have a totally dry pot. So get it, get moisture in there. But you're not going to water it more than once or anything. If you can protect this, like I said, over the winter, Rosa Sharon's a pretty hardy plant. Um, what we want to try to avoid is this pot freezing. We don't want this thing to be a solid brick rock. So, but we do want cold. We, we want them to stay dormant until it's time for them to not be dormant anymore. Um, they're actually going to emerge leaves uh, probably first before they ever even get roots in the spring. When the weather warms, they're going to trick these things and they're going to want to shoot leaves. That's whenever most of your root formation is going to happen. Like I was talking about earlier, when we transplant them, also with those little things, you can transplant them pretty early. With these, you really it's recommended you wait a full season to keep them in the same pot so they get this nice chunky root system. And then the next season is whenever we can start taking these out, separating the roots off from each other, and planting them out in the garden where you want them or into a big container so this is hardwood deciduous tree cuttings um, pretty cool like i said just avoid a freezing of the pot um, underneath your porch usually is fine in a cold shed that stays out of just the wicked wicked cold weather and you know in the wind um, but other than that it's a pretty simple process these are going to germinate in the or they're not going to germinate. they're going to sprout in the spring and they're going to you know produce roots and leave them in the pot for the rest of the season all right deciduous hardwood cuttings done with that all right next Let's do some evergreen cuttings. A little bit trickier, but not really. The principles are all still the same. Uh, generally here, you're going to take your cuttings in about this time, about mid midwinter time is what they say is whenever you should take your cuttings on that. These are a little bit slower to go. And the difference is, is that what you see is you see still leaves on these. These are actively photosynthesizing, even though with no roots, it's much, it's, it's slowed down greatly, but we've got to keep these things outside and we've got to keep sunlight on them. Whereas these don't, these could be in total darkness and it's not going to hurt anything. This one here is going to need to be kept in a plenty of sunlight and outside. Um, another thing is avoid, you know, fr freezing of the pot whenever you're taking these cuttings. So this is um, a Diodar cedar, Cedrus Diodara, one of my favorite uh, conifers that we sell. And there's no, I just took snipped these cuttings off earlier. There's no real difference with what you're going to do. We got to get these needles off. Got to create those wounds like I was talking about. And we're just going to go about, oh, not, probably about a half actually, up the stem, rubbing those off. There we go, just a touch more. So we have a lot of these nodes down in the soil. All right, so there's a nice little cutting. It's got plenty of stem down there below to root. And no different, y'all. It's all going to be the same kind of deal on how to stick them. Same thing, press it in. This one presses pretty easily. Get that tight to the soil and work them all in the same pot. And uh, it's as simple as that. Um, conifers are a little bit slower to root, though, so you kind of have to be patient with these take some time um, but like I said earlier just the the sunlight is needed for these so keep them outside but not in a frozen something that just gets frozen so there we go I'm not going to do another one y'all get the gist take the lower leaves off to about half stick them down in there uh, oh my bad you definitely want to use rooting powder when it comes to deciduous hardwood cuttings and also with evergreen cuttings it really really helps out like I'm talking 
success rate goes drastically up whenever you use this rooting hormone. So go ahead and get you some of this. It's good to have. All right. Oh, while I'm thinking about it, um, I wanted to mention some things that I know root in water and some things that don't. Generally, things that have a, a woody stem are not going to root in water very well, but I wanted to bring something that does, and that is rosemary. Believe it or not, rosemary will root in water. Same thing, take a stem where you want it. Good little cutting, strip lower leaves off, creating wounds, and simply stick it down in your water bottle. And you can have rosemary, shoot, you can you can grow it year-round inside the house if you want to, as long as your sunlight's good enough. Um, and it's an easy one to do. But I've done this before. I never thought rosemary would have rooted in water. Tried it one time, and it sure did. So uh, it's a good herb to use for uh, for a cutting in that, that scenario. All right. What's up next? Oh, I was going to bring these in to show... Hold on. All right. Succulents. Almost everybody has some succulents at the house. And I wanted to show you what succulents tend to do, a reason why I don't like them all that much, because they tend to get really leggy and it annoys me. So this little guy right here, you can even see. I can't even, it's falling out of its pot. It's so annoying. Sitting like that, and it wants to go out that way. But what I have here is the opportunity to make m new ones. So with this, I want to cut the leg out completely, so I'm going to go ahead, because it's going to regrow from down here. I can repot this into a bigger, a little bit bigger container, and I can see new growth coming from down there to make it a tighter plant. So I don't have to get rid of this mother plant. I can still use it. It's going to regrow, but I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it now so I can see some new growth. Let's go ahead and take that whole stem. I'm left with this. Not much to it, but I will see new leaves emerge from this, and it'll be fine. Put that to the side, but then what I do get is the opportunity to have more. Get the, that cut off. Get this lower limb cut off. I've even got a little baby that would for sure root and get it in there if I can get it snipped. It's a little rosette, if you will. That's a tiny one, but I think we've got enough there to make it work. Succulents are really easy to root, y'all, like really easy. I wanted to show y'all, which I'm about to get into, this. This is a leaf from a type of jade plant. And I wanted to show you this leaf had broken off, and I found it in the pot. And I don't know if y'all can see that or not, but it's already growing roots. You got that? And they're pink. It's kind of cool. But that's roots from a single leaf that just dropped off of the plant. Succulents are very easy to propagate. And this just naturally happened, fell down in the bottom of a pot. None of us did anything to it. It just did it itself. So pretty cool. So like I said, this little cutie is only that big. We're just going to stick that in. Same way I did the other ones. Get the other ones out too. That's got plenty of stem to root. You want to bury that pretty deep. Get it pretty deep or it's just going to look leggy. If you only put it in like that, it already just looks leggy. So put it in nice and you know flush to the, to the soil level. Got that one. Got this one. Three good little cuttings. Put them all in the same pot nice and tight together like that and you'll get a new potted plant that's free. And it's just fun to do. What I bring here? Oh yeah, same thing. It's just another one that's annoying me. This is the leaf that, same leaf that this came off of actually. I'm just gonna cut the leg out. I've already got my stem ready to go. Pop this down tight. Add moisture and you're good to go. Very simple. So like I said, succulents, everybody's got them. Um, and to get them looking a little bit better, you have to keep them cut a lot of times to keep them tight. So this right here is going to be our new plant. We're going to see new growth come from all those crotch angles where the nodes and buds are. And it'll make for a tighter plant. So, succulents. Done. Okay. Now, the next part of the cutting process is to show you something that's truly fascinating, which I've already just touched on. It's what we call leaf cuttings. Leaf cuttings are really cool to me. It's fascinating, actually. This is a Sansevieria, a common name snake plant, mother-in-law tongue, um, extremely popular trendy house plant right now, although it's very old school as well, been around forever. Um, I've had one for an extremely long time. Um, very simple to grow. But what's very unique about this plant, which not all plants do this, not, you know, leaf cuttings. The leaf cuttings are pretty rare, but this one will. So we're going to take a stem. This one's kind of taller than all the rest. I can get a whole lot of segments out of it. Go ahead and Take this, let me show you. Just take it all the way to the base. 
Um, this plant specifically does not regenerate after you make a cut from that same spot. It's going to spiral up from the center. That's where the new growth comes from. So you may as well just take it all the way to the base. All right, so we got our cut, got our leaf. So all we're gonna do very simply is cut this thing into segments. You wanna get a bunch of them to up your chances. That goes with any, any cuttings. So let's just cut these sections all about the same length if we can. Roughly, try to make clean cuts. Oh yeah, I need to mention, um, I'm not doing it today since we're just doing this for fun, but if you're doing a whole lot of cuttings and you're going from plant to plant and you're you know, you're know, doing a lot of that, especially plants that have been outside or whatever, uh, you probably wanna get some alcohol or something to sterilize your pruning cuts because if there is something that's gotten on these, um, that'll cause issues down the road. So a dip in your alcohol will sterilize them before you make your cuts. <coughs> So, got our segments. Oh, yeah, by the way, keep the orientation upright. Remember that. You can draw an arrow, like I was saying earlier, on which way is up. Do not flip-flop it or it will not work. Let's take these out. Back to this. And we're going to press that firm. And we're going to take our cuttings. And you're going to make more or less a line. Let me use this stick. Just going to kind of make a straight little indention right there a little bit and stick it snug you don't want to bury too too far but you got to bury some of that stem to keep it upright take that stem this is how a lot of these plants are propagated whenever we receive them i can tell by that because i see how they've done it and i can see where the new growth comes from what i have to stress to y'all like i was saying earlier so there there's our there's our cutting and we can do that with um every one of these stick them in press them in make a pot that's full like that with all of these. And what I want you to know is that, like I was saying earlier, no, no, when you have a, a leaf cutting, it's going to send its roots out whenever it does. It takes a while usually. It's going to send those roots out. And then from that, you're going to get new growth from those roots. You are not going to see regeneration of cells from up here. That's been cut. This part of the plant is more or less, it's, I say dead, it's not dead, It's but it is never going to regrow from this spot again. What you're going to get is roots, and the new growth will come up from the base, and you're going to get a whole new plant. Once that happens and you have a leaf that's up enough, you can cut that away or just don't even worry about it. Leave this thing up. It will eventually just kind of rot and fall off. But if that annoys you and you don't like to see that anymore, once this leaf gets up big enough, go ahead and make a clean cut on that because it doesn't matter. All we needed that for was to get roots. Um, and once you did, you get a whole new plant. Like I said, leaf cuttings are fascinating to me. This is one that's very easy to do it with. You can, you, you should, uh, uh, begonias uh, is, is funny because you can do leaf cuttings on begonias and you can cut that thing all up. I mean, like make a whole bunch of little pieces and stick them and, uh, and they will root, which is really just crazy to me, but that's, that's plants for you. Um, so yeah, uh, leaf cuttings. I love it. Let's all take right. a short question break. What's up? Um, how bad are fungus gnats? Does does that mean that your plants are doomed and you should throw them away? No, negative. Um, fungus gnats, the thing is, they're larvae. Fungus gnats don't really do anything, the adult form of them. Their larvae will feed down below on um, dead matter. They don't eat actual live growth of the roots. They take a care of other stuff that's inside the soil, so they really don't cause any harm to your plant. But it is a for sure factor that you have too much water because the, the moisture level is what they love and they will hover around a moist pot like that and they want to put their larvae down in that, that moist soil and um, that's going to be the issue. But no, it does not affect the plant at all. Um, it's just aesthetically displeasing and it leads to a lot of times like fungus. It'll be fungus down in the soil and that's what they can feed on. They feed on like decaying matter. So nothing wrong with the plant, but we don't. it, it generally says we're overwatering our plants. We need to back off that a little bit. All right. Uh, also, uh, can you take cuttings from blueberry plants in the winter and root them as the example of rooting woody stems you showed? Yes, that's exactly what I, Yeah, I didn't mention blueberries. There's a whole ton of woody stems out there that you can take cuttings from. Um, you might get online and do a quick search. There's so many plants out there that it's hard for me to keep up on when. But generally speaking, our hardwood deciduous cuttings, which blueberries are, um, you're going to take them in midwinter. That's just a general thing. But you might get online and just check, make sure, because there may be a more ample time to take blueberries cuttings a lot of times too like this is, I, we're doing a winter dormancy uh, or a winter propagation thing so that's why um 
I took that cutting off those woody stems, but there's a lot of woody shrubs that emerge in the spring and all that new tender growth that first flushes, that sometimes is the best time to get your cuttings off of plants. But like I said, since we're doing winter stuff, that's why I'm talking about it. But in the spring, a lot of times those new growth cuttings are really good to take as well. But yeah, if you want to do it the same way I did with those Rosa Sharon, go ahead and take your cuttings now and do what I was doing and get them in the pot and get them ready to go. And you should see them emerge in the spring. What about what about you? Can uh, you grow from cuttings? <laughs> <laughs> yes, in theory, every plant on earth can be grown from cuttings. Um, some are easier than others, but like I said, in theory, almost everything can be rooted from cuttings. All of the woody shrubs that you mainly see out here on our lot come from growers that took cuttings long ago. Boxwood specifically has been grown up by cuttings for, I can't even tell you how long, forever ago. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of woody things, evergreen things, anything can be grown from cuttings. It's nature's gift. It's truly amazing. How about regeneration? Bromeliads? bromeliads? Bromeliads you take you harvest from pups, so they're similar to um, cacti or um, a number of succulents that'll have the main part of the plant. Naturally, where bromeliads grow, they're gonna. What I believe they do is they flower and then they fruit, and then that mother plant will die. And then what happens below that is you see the pups come from the outer edge of that mother plant. What you're gonna do is harvest those pups. Um, pup, I just mean a little plant more or less. And what you want to do is you can dig that to where you get some of that root out of the ground and then repot from that. So cuttings on those are a little bit different. You're going to get more, you're going to take more vegetative, um, actual plant, you know, matter with its roots from bromeliads. Okay. Any more? Are we switching over? Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, any special soil for succulents transplanting? Uh, yeah, most all garden centers or even Lowe's and Home Depot will have what they call a succulent mix. And it's uh, it's very similar to a seed starting mix that I have here. Um, and as long as it's well-drained, some of the products will have some sand in them to help out with that. Uh, but like I said, just a well-drained soil and just work on your watering practices. That's that's the best thing. You know, I don't use any different product for any succulent versus any house plant versus any annual plant. Anything that I put in the pot, I typically use our same soil product that we sell here. I just know how to water them, so I make sure that some that need more water get it and some that need less get that as well. So um, it's just a light mix is what you want to use. Okay, and um, let's see. Would you add any mulch or straw to any of these pots? No, but a very common thing people do. Uh, professionals will do is use a like rock substrate they'll use um, some sort of um, you know little bitty rocks more or less to put on top all that really does is stops with the splashing of the soil a lot of times if you splash soil too much it'll get on the leaves and you can get fungal issues with that as well so it minimizes splashing and it also um, just it, it's easier to water it when, whenever if you try to water these things right off the bat with a heavy stream you're going to get a mess so putting rock down on top will prevent that from happening. So it is a, a good bet. I mean, if you wanted to use mulch, I don't really see why not. It wouldn't hurt anything. Um, but like I said, rock is usually used for that. It keeps the cuttings in place really well, too. It's heavy, so you can press it in nice and tight, and it'll keep those cuttings right where you want them. We don't want those things wiggling and moving around too much. So that that helps out a lot with that. All right, and how about... Um, uh can you root lavender and water the same way as rosemary? You know, they don't like to stay wet and die quickly from too much water. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah, uh, really wetness and, and soil compaction is a bad thing when it comes to lavender. I have never tried lavender in water. Um, I wonder. I think you ought to try. Go out and take some cuttings. I know lavender will root against the ground pretty well. I mean, it'll send a stem and kind of lay down on the ground, and just that contact will make it root. So if you have some lavender right now, go, get, go give it a go. Give it, do it the same way I did with rosemary. Give it two or three weeks and see what it does. Um, you may even have to wait a little bit longer than that. But if you start seeing it get nasty before you see roots, then it's generally a sign that it's not going to root in water. Cool. Okay, that's all for now. That's all for now. Okay, is that it for cuttings? Oh, um, I need to speak on humidity levels. Humidity levels need to be fairly high, when, especially if these are in your home. Um, when I was in college, we had a potting bench that was made specifically for cuttings. And all, we had a misting system that was really cool. I helped put it together, and it's just these risers that had misters on them. Every 10 minutes, the misters would mist for 10 seconds. Kept a very humid area around the roots, around the tops of the plants, all of it. And it just really, really helps with, with germination. So... Get you a little spray bottle, something that has a very fine mist to it. I've got this funny little looking like perfume bottle at the house that sends out this super fine mist, like a perfume bottle. And uh, that's what I use for humidity. And all you got to do is literally just go around your, you know, the plants that we took here. 
and missed them every once in a while. Um, you don't have to do it as intensely as what I was doing in college or whatever, but you just keep a moisture level. Also, the use of domes, you know, little plastic domes, you don't have to buy them that way. You can make, make them if you want. Just make a little, you know, a little hoop with like PVC or something. Just get creative. Put plastic over the top of them that'll, and put them in the window. That'll help out with your humidity levels. You can just, you know, spray them up inside there. And uh, it'll keep the hu- humidity where you need it. But that, that is fairly crucial with cuttings. It just helps out a lot. All right, cuttings. I do love cuttings. That's really, like, my favorite thing to do is to see that happen. Um, but for now, let's move on to another form of propagation, which is very simple, actually. It's not, nothing crazy. Let's see. What I got here? Good old monkey grass. All right, so this is going to be a kind of perennial discussion. Um, Making new plants with perennials is pretty easy because you don't really have to do anything that I've done so far. There's nothing that you need to know horticulturally special. Uh, You just kind of have to get in there and work at it. What you see here is monkey grass, big blue. Very probably the most popular border plant we sell. Uh, We sell them in little plug trays, one gallons, all of that. But a ton of people have this. And we get a lot of questions on how to separate, how to divide, and that's another form of propagation. So, get this tag out and show you. This goes with a number of your perennial plants. If you're a perennial grower and you've been doing it for years, you know perennial plants spread. Especially things like Black Eyed Susan, Echinacea, things like that are going to spread. And sometimes they can spread a little bit too aggressively. And we need to either get rid of them or we need to transplant them. So, not hard to do, especially when things are in pots. So, we're just going to kick this out. As you can see is multiple tufts, if you will, of grass. Have all those little guys in there. It's another good thing to note. You can buy a $5 one-gallon pot, and you can literally get, what, 20, I don't know, 10, 12 different plugs out of it. If you're, you know, you're on a budget and you need to fill a large area and you can use afford to watch them grow a little bit, buy you a one-gallon, take it home, and separate it, just like I'm about to do. It's pretty simple. So... Nothing fancy here. Just got to get in there. We're going to get this dirt away. It helps see what we're looking at. You can use uh, water for this if you're at home. I don't have any in here, but if you have a watering wand, uh, get a hard stream of water on this. Get the dirt knocked off a little bit easier. A lot of nice white roots. That's what you're looking for when you're looking at roots. If you see brown, nasty, yucky roots, then that's not a good sign. But you don't really have to be all that gentle with this. Just need to make sure we get some root. This monkey grass is tight. A lot of times you can use a tool on it. And I've got my burners here. Use that. Cut it down below. Hopefully I get some. This one here. Release. All right. So that's good enough. I'd like to get more root on the next one if I could. But really this is ample. It's really all you need. Stick this down either in the ground or in pots to let it root in a little bit more, and you've got yourself a little monkey grass. You can create, you know, you have a 50-foot border you want to use monkey grass with. You know, buying a whole bunch of these is going to get expensive, but if you can take them home and get some of these sprigs and get them stuck, then within the next couple seasons, you're going to have something that looks like this. This is just simply called dividing. This one here, I've got a good amount there. Now, that's multiple tough so i'm going to keep that together just because it looks a little bit more full but i've got a good root system there to just put in the ground uh water it right after you plant it make sure you press it in tight and you have new plants so not necessarily a propagation technique just something you do in your perennial gardens and like i said tons of plants you can do this with whenever it has multiples in the same pot when it comes to me and me buying plants been doing this so long and i end up spending a lot of money here um, doing this is something that I do a lot of getting one plant, separating them so I can get many, many more. All right. I've made a mess. Let's see. Let's just push that to the side. (laughs) All right. All right. The next forms of, let's see of propagation i'm going to talk about are kind of the the weirder ones Um, not used as much a little bit trickier to do um, but still fun i'm going to show you something Um, 
let me first talk about it. The one, the one thing we're going to talk about is called layering. Um, air layering specifically is what I'm going to show you how to do. Um, but layering more or less is just uh, in nature, how it happens naturally is, um, I know y'all have probably seen this, is whenever a stem of a tree, you know, gets too long and it tends to f go down so much that it hits the ground. Once it makes soil contact, it moves a little bit as the wind blows and it creates somewhat of a wound right there. Um, when you get that, you will get root formation and the roots will literally grow into the ground and you'll have a tree that'll sprout up from that. Um, that's what layering is called. A number of plants will do this. You often see it with vines. Um, you can do it with a tomato plant, let it get big enough, maybe one of its stems. If you can bend it down to the ground and you can pin it into the earth um, and cover it up a little bit, that plant will root. Um, and it'll send up a whole new stem. You can harvest that root and get you a whole new plant. So in nature, it's pretty cool. It's rare that it happens. You know, it doesn't happen all the time, uh, but it's really cool whenever you do see it. Now, what we can do, though, is mimic that process by um, doing it for them. We, you know, if you're going to do it outside in the garden, do what I was saying. Take a stem that's long enough, say like clematis, a lot of vines, things like that. Get the stem, get it, you know, down to the ground, pin it into the earth. Uh, that's how you can do it outside, a very simple way. But if we wanted to do something like a house plant, we're going to bring the earth to the stem, if you will. So, I've got here, Tyler, you see that good? All right, this is a ficus, ficus elastica. Um, and it's a very good candidate to do air layering. Air layering, all that means is, I need to show you. I got a clear, the materials I'm going to need here, I got a clear plastic sheet. Uh, it can be black, it can be clear. I like to use clear, that way I can see what's going to happen on the inside. Uh, very simple. Um, and I've got peat moss. I'm going to use, you can also use coconut core for this. Anything that just holds moisture pretty well is, is what you want to use. The most common thing to use is peat. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to need some water. I'm going to use this. And what else? Oh, yeah, some tape. You don't have to use tape like this. Um, really, it's no special way to do it. I'm just going to show you what you absolutely have to do to make this work. All right, so what we see here is a leggy stem. would be a good candidate to get some air layering from. We've got this plant here. Say I want another one. Um, I want to do something fun. See, I like to do air layering over the wintertime because I get bored. I, I'm ready for plants to happen. It's, it, you know, it, it just drives me wild. So it's just a fun little project to do that's not too hard for you to do, um, but it's going to take a little bit of effort. Got this stem here. So what do we want to do? First is make a wound. I'm going to do it about, got my knife here, about this far up. I'm gonna go all the way around the stem. See if I can create some some of that stem showing. Don't go too deep, but you do want to see. You got to create a wound, so we need to see some of that green right in there. I'm gonna take that all the way around and create a spot where this plant says, "Oh no, I'm wounded. I need to regrow," and it will. It's pretty fascinating, actually. So peel that back. Get this side. You don't have to get it all the way around. I just kind of like to. But you can make a spot really just on one little spot of this. As long as it's showing enough, it'll root from that. But I like it to root from all angles, so I'm going to go ahead and go all the way on the back side. Put that down there. All right, I've got plenty of... A little bit more step back. All right. So I've created a wound. Now, like I was saying earlier, we're going we're gonna to bring the dirt up to the plant. So this is kind of not real easy to do. But got my peat moss, spilled my water, and I need to wet this. Wet it a little bit. Get all the excess out of it so it's moist but not wet. You can do this with a number of plants, mainly indoor plants. Um, uh, corn plants, very easy to do it, not like actual corn, like you know, dracaena palms, corn plants we sell here. Very another very easy one to do it with. All right, so now, somewhat tricky part. 
is getting this all around this stem very tight without it going away. It's kind of tricky to do. Helps to have a couple people. All right, wrap that around it. And the next step is we've got to seal this thing up. All right, use this green tape. This is just horticultural tape. It's nice and soft. It's good for tying things up very much for this scenario. The key is here is we want to keep everything inside that bag. So we need to seal it pretty tight around the top there. Hope it doesn't fall out. That sealed up tight. Let's twist this bottom. Once again, tight around the stem. It's not too hard, but it does take a little effort. Seal that one up. Make sure you get that. I even double tie it. Make sure you get it good and tight. And then where it's open in the center here, I just like to use tape. And this is the tape I had today, but I would use better tape than this. But just take your tape and seal it up real good around that center so we're not getting air inside there. Tape around it. Now, I'd do it a few more times just to make sure you're good and sealed up. So, what we have here is this cool little baggie of dirt around this wound of this stem. And within two or three weeks, you're going to see roots emerge from this, which is I mean, fascinating to me, um, but it will. And you're going to, like I said, I like to use clear plastic because I like to see the roots whenever they do emerge. After the roots do emerge inside this bag and you can see them, there's going to be some big white chunky roots on it. Whenever you can see that, the whole point of doing this is to get a new plant. This, this will be our whole new plant. So whenever you see the roots right here, you take your, your pruners and you cut it off below that bag where you made your wound on it and where you have roots cut below that. Take that directly with the roots on it to a new pot, its new home, and repot it, and you've got a whole new plant. So, layering, it's not done all that often, but it is just a fun little project to do over the wintertime uh, to keep you busy with your plant. Something else to, to try anyway. Now you know how to do it. I didn't do the greatest job sealing it up. Make sure you seal it up. That's really pretty crucial. There you go. Air layering. All right. Uh, yeah, that's about it when it comes to layering. Like I said, it happens in nature. We can do it, but that's about all I got on that. We got another question from Facebook. What's a good plant to put in the tomato beds next year, rotating in and out over time? Oh, well, you probably just, it doesn't matter too much, except you want to avoid going with the same um, family of plants. So tomatoes are a Solanaceae family. Um, potatoes are also that. Eggplant is also that. Avoid using those Solanaceous crops. Go with something else, maybe a legume. Um, get some beans out there to switch up. That'll get some nitrogen fixed back in the soil and uh, just build your soil content over the years. So yeah, just avoid the, the nightshade family, which is that Solanaceae. Um, and you can read about which plants are, are, are that. I've already mentioned some that are, that are in that family. We'll also so. have a companion planting webinar coming up uh, later uh, this uh, winter spring season. We've got a lot of webinars actually on the schedule now. <laughs> if you head to our website and hit register now, a couple of tiles down, uh, you can see everything there, calendar, description, and uh, register for Zoom. Cool. Uh, what's my next one? I'm doing something. What was it? My next webinar? I don't remember now. Anyway, all right, what's the last thing? Oh, yeah, I brought something in here. Okay, the last thing, which is probably the hardest thing to achieve if you don't know what you're doing. Um, I've actually done a little bit of this work, but not too, too much. It's a little bit tricky. It's called grafting or budding. Um, two pretty much of the same thing, 
but different styles of how you do it. Now, I'm not going to get too much into grafting because there is a, that could be a whole nother webinar on how people do this. There's all sorts of styles, different cuts. It will be. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Uh, there's professionals that, that do this for a living. Like, that's all that they do. Um, it's a pretty cool little process, but it's a little bit more effort on the home gardener. What grafting means is, is that we're going to take tissue from two different plants um, that we want. Now, they got to be very similar plants. Like, you're going to use apples with apples and pears with pears. Generally, I say fruit trees because most of the time, or almost all the time, any apple tree or fruit tree you buy from us or anybody in the country, it's going to be grafted. So what that means is that we take the part of the plant that we want and we graft it onto the plant that we want to use its roots from. So with apple tree, we'll just use those because they're commonly used. Um, apple trees have a desired root stock is what we call that. So it has disease um, immunity and it's got um, you know, cold hardiness. We, we're looking for that when we're coming to the root end of the plant. So this apple that we've chosen has all of that. It's very hardy. It's got disease resistance. And then what we want on the other end, which is going to be our top part of the graft, is what we want fruit-wise. So we want our apples to be green, or we want them to be super sweet. We want them to be tart. We want them to be yellow. Whatever that is we desire up top, we're going to take those two plants and we're going to fuse them together, which is called grafting. Um, really what that means is taking two, if you, if it were sticks, if it were buds, whatever it is, you're going to make a cut that's going to be the same cut on the mother plant that's there. Like kind of say, do it at an angle. We do this one at an angle. You're going to cut the stem up top at an angle as well. We're going to fuse those on top of, on the stem like this. We're going to tape those up really, really tight to where they're very firm. So you have the actual cellular layers touching each other. And when that happens, amazingly enough, they fuse. And whenever they fuse like that, what you see is the bud from the what you did will send a new stem up. That will be your new plant. So genetically, they're different. The top is different than the, than the bottom. Once the new growth forms, you can cut off the old stem that you don't want anymore and use the new stem to go up to be your new fruit producing part of the plant with the disease resistance down below in the roots. I was going to try to perform this a little bit the way that I've seen it done. I've toured a farm where there was uh, guys called butters is what they, they do, and they, that's all they do for them. They go around farm to farm, and they, they cut buds for people. They have an extremely sharp knife. I got a razor blade, and I'm not the steadiest of hands. I don't want to cut my finger off here, but this is what I'm talking about. Another very common plant to graft is a magnolia. This is a deciduous magnolia, so it's one that loses its leaves. And um, the most basic form of grafting is called budding, where we're just going to take a single bud. Um, hopefully, I can show you how to do this. What they did, what I saw them doing, is they made this cut kind of this way, horizontally on the stem. And they made another one above the stem to try to get a chip a piece of this bud that I'm going to need. I'm going to need some green growth along this chip, and I need that bud right there. What they did is they took that, and then they took, sliced it up all the way to that chip. And it should nick off is what we want. Take that back side off. And it broke for me, which is perfect. So then what I'm left with is this cute little stick of wood with a bud attached to it. This is literally all it takes to produce a new plant. Um, what they would do is they take these sticks right here and let me see. Oh, I didn't bring a... Here, I'll show you on this same piece of wood. All right, so if, say, this is my plant that's in the ground. This is an apple tree. Just, just We'll just say that for now. Um, take this bud off of it. This is what we have as our tree. This has been growing in the ground for a year or two. It's already in the ground. What these butters are going to do is they come and they find on that stem and they go low to the stem. The graft is usually low. What they're going to do is they're going to make a T. This is called a T graft. Just going to slice it just a little across there. One horizontal cut and then one vertical cut. Long enough so this chip can stick in it see this is the detailed part that those guys are really good at that i'm not as good at we've got to open that flap uh, 
Got that flap opened a little. Need to, there we go. All right, flipped open enough. All they literally do, take that bud, point it up. The orientation is, is important. It needs to be up. And they slip that. A lot easier on a plant that's already like seeded in the ground. And they slip it down in. The other part of that, I didn't do a great job, but you can see where I'm what I'm after here. What I want is both of those green parts of that plant fusing together so they're pressed tightly together after that they take some tape or they take rubber bands and they wrap that thing up really good sorry y'all i'm not the best grafter on earth but <clears throat> you can see what we're trying to do and you can get online and see all sorts of different like ways to do this and watch these guys do it it's pretty impressive um but that's what we're after we're looking for green cellular tissue on top of other green cellular tissue um, and that'll create the graft and then that bud is what's going to take off in the spring be our new stem, and then we're going to cut everything else away. So another propagation method that's fun to play around with, uh, I'd say do some practicing before you try to really do it, but magnolias are a good one to do it on. If you've got some deciduous magnolias, you can work on some grass with that. It's not hard at all. Just know uh, don't don't cut in too deep. We just need a little bit of that, that bark peeled back to get them slipped in there. Uh, going back to air layering, can sure. you air layer an outside plant as you did with the rubber tree? Um, some plants do better than others when it comes to that. And yes, I think you can do that. In theory, most of them all will. Um, it's worth a try. Uh, but like I said, you have to, you have to make a wound. So you want to get that bark peeled off, do it the same way I did it. But I will say air layering for some reason is much more practiced with tropical indoor type plants. Um, that's whenever people do it the most, but like I said, I mean, any plant that makes contact with the dirt and it has a wound, um, it can potentially root. So what's kind of cool about that, say you're out in the woods and a, a little seedling or whatever, say it's three foot tall, a little oak tree or something like that. Say a deer comes along and just, you know, rakes on it or whatever, cuts the head right out of it. So, you know, branch comes off about this far, lands on the ground, and then say another animal walks by and steps on that stem and presses it into the ground just enough uh, to have, make soil contact and moisture right there, that wound will tell that plant, I want to try to root. And in theory, it can. And this does happen in nature. So give it a shot. I mean, it's, it's just fun to try these things. So, yeah, I mean, let me know, too, if it works and what you used it on, and I'll pass that along. But, yeah, I, I think it's worth a try for sure. It's just not generally done all that much with outdoor plants. Cuttings are probably the most preferred method for getting, you know, new, new plants. <clears throat> Something right. that I'm, uh, what you got? Uh, can you, well, okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a webinar soon on grow lights, but, uh, best grow lights and instructions for propagating monstera kind of just, is it a heat mat or entire node in water? Uh, more than one node in water, if you could. Uh, but monstera is well known for rooting very easily. Um, it's another one. Air layering is good to use. Uh, it's a fun one to do. You can use that. Um, that can be your first project because they root really easily from that. Cuttings work really easy, easily with monstera. Not an issue. And yeah, in water, I think they root too. I don't. I've, yeah, they definitely root in water. Um, so that one's not all that tricky. Now. Using a heating mat, though, does help. When I was talking about misting earlier with, with cuttings, if you have like a whole tray of cuttings you're trying to use, using a heat tray up underneath them to keep that uh, warmth in there along with the mist really helps out with, with rooting as well. So not a bad idea to use that. And also just how to get large quantities of filtered water for watering large amounts of plants. Hmm, that's tricky one probably um, a water catchment system somehow um, no, i don't say somehow i know how you can do it you can get these big deals at um, probably a horticulture type place that you hook up to your gutters at, at, at your house put it on the corner of your house maybe on the backyard because it's you know so it's not so unsightly but you hook this thing directly up to your gutter system and it you know goes right into that and it catches all this rainwater. now to be filtered you're going to have to either buy that what that has a filter already in it or you're going to have to create some sort of you know filtration thing with like some sort of cloth or something you know layered up on top of each other to help get the you know to filter it out a little bit but yeah if you need large quantities of water i mean collecting the rain is probably the best way to do it it's just kind of a, a thing you kind of have to you know that's a that's an investment but it's, it's a good idea a lot of people do it <clears throat> 
All right. Emily asks, uh, what flower seeds can we plant now and what veggies for zone seven? Oh, it's a little early still right now. We don't, we don't want to go. January is still too early. February is generally too early as well. Our, um, for veggies and annual flowers, our planting dates are generally April 15th. That's kind of what we go by here in Nashville. It's not always the case. Uh, this past year, we had, what, April 28th, like, freeze, like, nasty freeze. So a lot of people's veggies got kind of wiped out. General rule of thumb is get them planted in your seed trays inside six weeks, six to eight weeks um, before you want to set them outside, which is April 15th. So I know we're getting uh, antsy to get going, but we need to wait a little while. Um, some things that are fun that I've done before, we, if you want to do some seed, uh, wheatgrass. Believe it or not, get you a nice pot that's cute, maybe a white one uh, that it just looks good with the green. It's just literally like grass. It's wheatgrass. What you see in the fields, um, out in the farmer's fields right now that are covered up that, with green, that's just wheatgrass. We sell that here, and um, I did it last year is why I mentioned it. It's just kind of fun. I had a pot that was about, about that big, not much bigger than this size right here, um, and I just loaded seeds on top of it. I mean, I put them tight, real, real tight pressed them in the same way I showed you how to do these seeds over here, uh, watered them. And I'm not even joking within like five days, not even I had leaf, you know, emergence, grass emergence. And it just filled this pot and it was just this cute, you know, grassy pot that was, that was just pretty for the winter time. It was just something to do. Not that I was going to use it for anything. It was purely ornamental, but it's something to have fun with over the winter time. Whenever all us plant people are feeling pretty antsy. All right. What else we got? Anything? Yeah. We got uh, another one here. Um, let's see. I, I've I've read a lot of hardy annuals should be planted in the fall. Let's let's call them perennials, I guess, because annuals die every year, right? Yes. So, yeah. Annuals are not hardy. Yeah. Um, through our winters here, perennials are though. Yes. So, uh, is it too late to plant? perennials now or can you sow perennials in winter without protection if your ground can be worked and then recommended perennials to plant now just kind of a off the top of your head okay um yeah perennials right now is total fine fine to plant them um it's a little bit daunting i think for a lot of people because you come out here and you buy like a pot of dirt because most perennials don't look like they have anything in the pot all of ours you know we give them a cut back straight to the ground um so what you're seeing down below is or what you have is just roots down below you don't really have anything up top so i think that's a little bit scary for a lot of people but really planting in the winter time is a fine time to really plant most things uh, perennials are, are the same um if you're willing to to buy a pot of dirt <laughs> or or separate from your own garden um, then yeah, there's no, no problem with doing that. What we do want to avoid is a frozen ground. I mean, no plants, especially new ones really like that all that much. Um, plants that are established in the ground can take a frozen ground just fine. I mean, they, they it thaws and there's nothing wrong with it, but, um, while we're transplanting, it's probably best to avoid that. So as long as the ground's not frozen, then yeah, I mean, perennials are, are fine to plant right now. All right. Well, that's about all questions. Are, are you wrapped up too? Or? I'm pretty well wrapped up. I did want to mention one more technique that's I'm not going to show you because it's way out of my realm. It's straight up science <clears throat> to the max is um, tissue culture. That's another way of propagating plants. Now, you need to get online and look at this. It's extremely interesting. The theory is, is that you can take as small as one single cell from a plant and regenerate it into a new one. This would change the ball game when it came to propagation for all horticulturists and nurserymen out there because the amount you can get would be unbelievable. I'm telling you, like, they're doing good work right now with heuchera, which is a perennial leafy plant we sell here. I've heard that it it has tissue, it does tissue culture well. Um, and it's literally created in a lab by scientists. They're all masked up and they got their, it's all, you know, a sterile environment. They're using very proper equipment um, they got these vials everywhere and really it's just taking very small amounts of plants putting it in a, a vial with water and also the nutrients it's going to need once it does root and start growing um, but it's like the cutting edge of plant propagation and they're still working on it it's not like it's it ain't going anywhere i mean it's 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 science and it would like i said it would change the ball game if they really got it you know fine-tuned which they will um so just look into that just because it's kind of interesting and fun to see what they can do with the tiniest parts of a plant and make it into a new mother plant so yeah i think that's all i've got 
How long did we go? What oh, time is it? We're 30 minutes over, but it was what? an incredible experience. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. All right, guys. Well, I got to go. Uh, really, really appreciate y'all signing up and watching this each week. Um, it's something new that we've done. Tyler here, who's got it all put together, has got this place just awesome. I got lights all over the place, sound I mean, it's it's all good. What we're trying to do is get you the best info we can. So um, keep watching us. We'll hopefully we'll keep churning out some good ones, some ones you want to see, and uh, we'll be back next week. <laughs>